So, first of all, my disclaimers, I do advise most companies uh, that make tools or agents that help us uh, treat people living with diabetes. And I like to start with this slide, reminding us how easy our life was uh, uh, several years ago, not so long ago, actually, end of the 90s. Type 1 diabetes in young children. We had type 2 diabetes typically affecting older people. We had very few agents to treat people with. We had sulfonuria, metformin, and NPH insulin. And oh, how the world has changed. We have now a new phase of diabetes. First of all, let me take you to the new phase of type 2 diabetes, and especially the age spectrum that is now very different from uh, years ago. Here you can see in this uh, publication from 2020 how the evolution of the uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes has evolved with uh, more and more people getting type 2 diabetes. But you also see in orange the incidence shifting to the left. So people getting type 2 diabetes at younger age. And that's a new phenomenon. Indeed, now in the United States, here published in uh, 2020, we have now about one in five adolescents and about one in four young adults living with dysglycemia or any form of uh, prediabetes. And this really impacts these people's lives because if you look at the control in people, young people with diabetes, this is not well. Here in the search study, again conducted in the United States, you see, first of all, the very bad control of people with type 1 diabetes not improving a lot over the years, but also those with type 2 diabetes are not improving, if anything, they are deteriorating over it. And this is a problem, because if you get type 2 diabetes at a young age, you will have more complications in later life. And later life is not so much later. Indeed, in this study of the uh, day uh, group, you see that already nine years after follow-up of a cohort of young people with type 2 diabetes, you see that 50% of them have any microvascular disease. And this deals with kidney disease, deals with hypertension, dyslipidemia, nerve. So people with youth onset of type 2 diabetes by that we mean during their adolescence or in their early 20s, have a bad problem. And of course, in our consensus here, you can see one of the figures of ADA ESD consensus on the treatment of hyperglycemia in people with type 2 diabetes. We do propose how to approach type 2 diabetes, specifically glycemic control. But we have a problem. Indeed, if we first of all look at the phase 3 trial, the pharmaco logical glucose-lowering therapies, only a minority, less than 5%, are in the young adult range, 18 to 39 years of age. And there's no adolescence in these studies. When looking at the outcome trials, so the cardiovascular outcome trials or the renal outcome trials, they're an even smaller minority, less than 1%, are in the young adult age. And so this gives us really a big dilemma where uh, we say that, first of all, people who are young are at very high risk, but that we have very few evidence on uh, them in outcome trials. But still we say it's not because we do not have the outcome that young people with type 2 diabetes should not be treated aggressively and given access to the drugs that have proven cardiorenal protection in older individuals. So young adults with type 2 diabetes, growing problem, and we as clinicians need to be aware that they have a high risk of complications and we should treat them aggressively. Now, I also showed you the other part of this figure, namely the fact that we have more and more very old people living with type 2 diabetes. And here, again, we have an underrepresentation of such participants in clinical trials, people about 65 and especially people about 75. Here you can see an overview where they um, uh, listed the participation of people over 65, still about one third, one uh, half of the participants in the clinical trials. 
but over 75, there it is really a minority. And so here again, we need to say that the evidence is rather limited. But when we look at the evidence for the GLP-1 receptor agonists in red square and the SGLT2 inhibitors in the blue square, if we look at the hard outcomes in the outcome trials, the cardiovascular and the renal outcome trials, you see that there is a similar outcome for the individuals above and below 65 years of age. And here also, if you look at the uh, individuals above and below 75 years of age on the renal or cardiovascular outcomes, it is really the same group. So again, here, the recommendations for selection of medication to improve cardiovascular or a kidney outcome should not differ in uh, older individuals. But we do say that we need to be careful that in some individuals of old age, for instance, there may be an issue of underweight or even a higher uh, risk of hypoglycemia and the complications of hypoglycemia like undesired falls. And so when choosing glucose-lowering agents in elderly individuals, we need to be careful. Because indeed, here we put forward a lot the fact that you not only need to have glycemic targets for individuals with type 2 diabetes, but also weight targets, and also consider the effect of glucose-lowering agents on weight. And so in people of very high age, you have the opposite now of obesity. With aging, you start to have the phenomenon of sarcopenia, skeletal muscle dysfunction, and overall frailty. And thus, when choosing the glucose-lowering agents, you need to take into account the profile of the individual rather than the calendar age. Look at the profile. You have an obese individual, you have a frail individual. And then again, take into account these uh, phenotypic characteristics when choosing glucose-lowering agents. And consider the de intensification of therapy. For instance, intensive insulin treatment. If you have an elderly, demented individual, why still persevere with very, very strict glucose control if you need to use insulin for it? You may consider So there is a new phase of type 2 diabetes. The young with a lot of complications, and their very intense treatment needs to be there. The elderly, where choice of glucose lowering agent will have to be adapted to the profile of the individual. And again, evidence being quite rare in these both ends of the age spectrum. Let us move now to type one diabetes where the big revolution is technology. Indeed, we have come a long way since 100 years ago, insulin was first clinically used now we have our insulin pens, we have insulin pumps, but also we have novel ways of measuring uh, glucose through our sensors. And the entry of technology really made it. Here I bring you real-world evidence from Belgium, where we have looked at hemoglobin A1c in real world uh, in Belgium, in uh, individuals in the year 2010, in the year 2015, and in the year 2017. And in the red, evolving to the green, evolving to the most recent blue, you do see hemoglobin A1c levels come down. What is the big difference? It is technology. Not use of insulin pumps. That has only progressively increased, but it is the introduction of CGM, of sensors, that has really pushed the blue curve down over these 10. So what does technology do for people with type 1 diabetes? It reduces the burden of type 1 diabetes. It reduces the number of decisions to be made. It makes life a little bit easier with type 1 diabetes. And especially those systems where you have decision support incorporated in the treatment of type 1 diabetes. And here I'm, of course, referring to the hybrid closed-loop systems. 
where if you look at the number of decisions and checkpoints of people living with type 1 diabetes over a 24 hour time span if you can if you can use a hybrid closed loop system there you see that the number of decisions is really decreased and looking at the hemoglobin a1c looking at the time in range but also at um, patient related outcomes so the burden of disease this really brings in a dramatic amelioration of uh, living with type 1. And so where is the field of type 1 diabetes going to when it comes to new insulins, new technologies, et cetera? First of all, we are trying to go towards a more physiological insulin profile with less hypoglycemia, but especially with improvement of quality of life, less burden for the person living with type 1 diabetes. But also what needs to happen in the next, in the near future, is really to improve cost and access to insulin, but also access to sensors and access to these new technologies for people to, with type 1 diabetes all over the world. And so looking at the discoveries or the research that is happening towards a physiological insulin profile, Research on glucose-sensitive insulins is happening in industry. And so I am a big believer that we will see this happen. But of course, also the technology is infiltrating here with smart pumps, closed-loop systems, and artificial pancreas being made. Improving quality of life, as already said, these smart uh, pumps and closed-loop systems will uh, ameliorate a lot. Uh, patient-related outcome, but also, for instance, non-parenteral insulin, inhaled insulin, the oral insulin may be an important step forward for specific individuals living with type 1 diabetes. And then again, taking into account cost and access worldwide to insulin, but also to the technology. Indeed, having improved affordability global access, but also novelty, like heat insensitive insulin is very important. And let's also keep fighting for access to new insulins, access technologies through all healthcare systems for everybody living with type one. And so what about age and technology? Well, more and more, we do have evidence that also very young people and very old people do very well with these new technologies. And so advanced technologies should be uh, not based on um, uh, age, but should really be based on functional status, life expectancy. And so novel technologies should not be uh, 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 avoided in very young and in very old just on the basis of it. I want to use my final minutes to really talk about the next step, another new phase in type 1 diabetes, and that is disease-modifying therapies, type 1 diabetes. This is the flame of hope uh, in front of Banting House in uh, Toronto, Canada, and that's a flame that will keep burning until we cure um, uh, diabetes. And in November last year, a, a milestone was achieved, namely the first disease-modifying therapy in type 1 diabetes was approved for um, use in individuals who have two or more autoantibodies and have already dysglycemia to delay the progression towards clinical type 1 diabetes. And here you can see uh, the, the crucial study that was published by Kevin Harold in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, where he demonstrated in a small number of individuals that administration of eplizumab, so an antibody directed against CD3, a marker on the surface of specific uh, T lymphocytes, that compared to placebo uh, treatment, this succeeded in delaying the onset of uh, clinical type 1 diabetes by almost uh, three years. And that was an important enough milestone for FDA to approve this aid. 
Now, the problem is, if you want to prevent type 1 diabetes, how do you find the people at risk? He's sitting there, Mr. Waldo, but how do we do it for risk of type 1 diabetes? A lot of initiatives are sprouting throughout the world, in Europe, for instance, on screening for uh, type 1 diabetes risk by presence of genetic risk or what is most popular, by screening for the presence of autoantibodies directed against antigens of the beta cell. And here, the seminal work by Annette Ziegler, where she took data from different registries and where she showed that independent of the person being a family member of a person with type 1 diabetes or a person from the general population, Annette Ziegler showed in this study that if you have two or more antibodies, two or more types of autoantibodies against antigens of the beta cell, that your risk of moving towards type 1 diabetes is almost 100% if you wait long enough. Having one autoantibody is not really predictive for um, uh, uh, evolution towards clinical type 1 diabetes. But so we know now that if you have two or more autoantibodies, you are on your way to type 1. And so many studies have been tried now in people with one autoantibody, two autoantibodies, auto and dysglycemia. But the majority of trials have been running in individuals with newly diagnosed type 1. There's still some beta cells to be saved, but not a lot. And so we really want to move this field forward to stage 2 and even stage 1. And in stage 2, we have now our first agent with deplizumab that has been approved by the FDA. But let me share with you some of the studies that are happening in individuals with stage 3, so newly diagnosed type 1. And these studies are happening in a European project called Inodia, where we are working together with many, many researchers to find better biomarkers of type 1 diabetes and also test intervention. And so four interventions have been tested in Inodia. One still ongoing is a study where we are using antitimosine globulin, so a polyclonal uh, uh, antibody directed against human T lymphocytes. And so here we are building on the studies of Mike Haller, who showed that with 2.5 milligram per kilo on two consecutive days at the time of diagnosis of T1D, you can protect functional beta cell mass. In this study, the MELD ATG study, we are looking for the minimal effective low dose. So we are looking whether even lower doses than the 2.5 milligram per kilogram is effective in protecting functional beta cell mass. We are recruiting individuals as low as five years of age until 25 years of age. And here we are now um, uh, well evolved in recruitment. Uh, 84 patients have been treated to date. And we need to go up to 140. The impact study that is now fully recruited was a study in um, adult individuals where we are studying emotopes, a modified antigen to try and restore tolerance in individuals with newly diagnosed. Vera T1D is a study using verapamil, the antiarrhythmic drug that many of you will know, um, but that in the meantime has been shown also to interact with uh, proteins in the beta cell and improve beta cell health. And there are some smaller studies that are very encouraging that it may indeed, again, protect functional beta cell mass. Again, a study in adults. Uh, again, a study now uh, uh, well uh, recruited, uh, more than 70 people uh, treated. They need to go up to one. Then there was another study with a CD40 ligand, uh, 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 a CD40 uh, targeting uh, antibody. And this was a study, again, running in young adults, but this uh, study has been put on hold by Novartis for strategies. 
But so many studies are happening worldwide. And I am a big believer that one day we will be able to extinguish this flame and to prevent delay type 1 diabetes. And if we can also implant new islets, we will cure type 1. So my conclusion, I showed you some glimpses on how the face of diabetes is evolving. The age of people with type 2 diabetes, it's not a disease anymore of only old people. It's also a disease of young people. But we do have new profiles of very elderly people living with type 2 diabetes. We have type 1 diabetes with the technology. We have type 1 diabetes being screened for with now people being identified with this autoimmune disease before they have hyperglycemia and with new disease-modifying therapies also coming into our hands. Other phases I could have discussed, like pre-type 2 diabetes, Cystic fibrosis, people with long-standing type 1 diabetes, diabetes in pregnancy, the obese type 1. But that will be for another time. Thank you for your attention.